You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than why is Hippopotamonstrous sesquipedaliophobia such a long term if it means a fear of long words, that question would have to be, Mark, what are your first impressions of Nikon's new Z-mount 180-600mm to f5.6-6.3 to VR zoom lens? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. Here it is. I managed to get my greedy mitts on Nikon's latest zoom telephoto lens, the 180 to 600 millimeter f5.6 to 6.3 Z. The question is, is this a wildlife kukri, a Gurkha blade to cut through the undergrowth and get you close to the distant action, or is it just a chunky boy that uses the term big boned to make up for its lack of ability on the sporting field? Firstly, let's have an unboxing, which honestly is a pretty sad experience given that all you get is a lens, some corrugated cardboard and the usual disclaimers and liability limitations in the thank you for purchasing documentation. Other than that, you have a solid piece of glass and metal and quite a lot of polycarbonate. First complaint, look at this. I mean, seriously, is this what counts for a 21st century lens case? Hey, don't get me wrong, I'm not actually a fan of unnecessary bulk and weight and for the most part, a case is superfluous when you're just going to fix the lens on the camera for the whole day or you're planning on putting it in your camera bag anyway. But look at this. And then look at this. Uh, is this some kind of napkin? You couldn't even wipe the lens down with this after running through the sprinklers, much less protect it from knocks and jolts in transit. So let's throw this lens nappy aside and look at the actual optic itself. In that sense, this is quite a respectable unit. Yes, it's big, but let's compare it to its rivals. It's dwarfed by the Nikon 400mm f2.8. Of course, that's a much brighter lens and has a built-in teleconverter. Compare it to some of the others on the lineup, and this is a chunky boy for sure. But this lens doesn't extend, and it has much more reach than its peers. We're dealing with physics here. A long telephoto full-frame lens is never going to be small, and even if you compare it to what is probably its closest sibling, the 100 to 400 millimeter, Nikon's is kind of on a par and actually benefits from having an internal zoom so the lens never trombones like a horny wolfhound's love whistle. Which brings us to ergonomics, and uh, overall this lens feels pretty good in the hand. It's fairly balanced on my Z6, which isn't the biggest Nikon uh, body out there, but it's not the smallest either. At just over two kilos, and just under if you take the tripod mount off, it's heavy for sure, but not unmanageably so. You could definitely take this out and use it without a tripod, though you definitely feel that you're holding a lens with a camera attached to it, rather than the other way around. It has a very cool button on the outside, well four of them really, that you can configure, though they all operate the same function, rather than work independently. You can also reprogram the manual focus ring if you want, though I found the ability to just tweak focus on the fly really, really useful, so I'd never want to reconfigure that. The real benefit comes from the 180 to 600 millimeter zoom, which is incredibly versatile and can be racked through the zoom range rapidly because of the short throw of the zoom ring. So it's a well-balanced, not too heavy and not too big lens that you can handhold fairly easily. But how does it perform in real life, specifically wildlife? After all, isn't that what you buy a lens like this for other than perving on your neighbors through the front window? Well, to find out, I went on safari. Well, I went to the zoo anyway, because fearless adventurer that I am, I wasn't gonna get my knees dirty crawling through the undergrowth.
So I survived the African savanna, the parched desert, steamy jungle and frozen Antarctic tundra, all to bring you the magic of wildlife photography. No monstrous hippos here despite the teaser in the intro, but I promise you plenty of sesquipedalian commentary on the experience. Actually, the main issue was the place was infested with children rather than animals, and to be honest, I do have mixed feelings about zoos. They definitely serve a purpose to educate us and protect some endangered species, and I'm sure some creatures have a much better life inside than they would outside. Perhaps not this possum that inadvertently encroached on an orangutan's perch last weekend and found himself on the receiving end of a literal crash course in flying, though. The possum did survive, apparently, though I understand he's considering civil action against the hairy primate. Look, as far as prisons go, and hairy aerial marsupials aside, Perth Zoo is probably one of the better ones. They at least try to enrich the lives of their inmates, even if it's with plastic containers and rags, rather than playing David Attenborough documentaries or Shakespeare through widescreen high definition TV sets in their enclosures. Personally, I'd love to see a version of Hamlet about a pot-bellied pig with daddy issues, but I digress. We're here to talk about lenses, not how Netflix can solve the streaming wars by tapping into the exotic animal demographic. The Nikon Z 180 to 600 mm lens did not disappoint. I could comfortably hand hold it for three hours and shoot it either in my hands or on a railing. As for the images, well, they weren't perfect, but as these giraffe examples show, they came out sharp and vibrant. I did edit them, but I'll show you some of the raws so you can see that not too much was needed to be done other than applying a bit of adjustment to colors and levels. One of the big issues with telephoto lenses is that you're usually using them in situations where you don't have much flexibility in terms of backing up or getting close to the action. Wildlife subjects don't typically respond to your directions unless they're auditioning for that animal farm version of Taming of the Shrew. I love primes for standard and wide focal lengths. Being able to zoom, though, with an ultra telephoto is a must for me, and it's the reason I didn't buy the Nikon 400m Z lens. That and the $2,500 price difference. The ability to get moderately wide was useful for context, though I did find the inclusion of fences or foliage could be distracting and undermine the wilderness narrative I was going for. And I was much more fascinated by the close-up details of the animals. So the short throw zoom was able to afford me the best of both worlds accessing any focal length with the turn of a finger. But what about the aperture? After all, the big compromise here is that the f-stops range from 5.6 at the wide end to 6.3 at 600 millimeters, which is tighter than the sphincter muscles of a mid-flight possum and has the light gathering capability of a naked mole rat. Balancing the small aperture with the need for fast shutter speeds to compensate for the long focal length and the fact that these creatures move meant high ISOs, but overall I was surprised with how well the photos turned out. My favourite picture was actually taken at ISO 11400. And while I did use some AID noise, the fact that my red panda held up to a bit of processing is testament to both the sharpness of this lens and the ability of the Z6 sensor to resolve detail with such gain. I wouldn't want to go higher than ISO 12800. It was hard extracting the detail from the white fur of this lemur, but I think we're now well past the cringe of digital infancy where we needed to keep the ISOs down for fear of gut churning grain. Honestly, the biggest issue I had was with focusing. And I can't really blame the lens for that. Despite some great firmware updates throughout its life, the Z6 is now showing its pedigree as a first generation mirrorless camera with quite unreliable autofocusing. I found myself flitting between auto area, tracking, and single point autofocus modes depending on the situation, which was a bit frustrating. 
There's no animal eye detection in this camera and it suffers for it. Single point autofocus worked for slow moving subjects for the most part, but I did struggle finding focus on the black irises of tiny mammals at 600 millimeters and f6.3. Once nailed though, the results were amazing. Crows are everywhere in Western Australia, but the vividness with which this creature's eye was rendered could make for the cover of an Edgar Allan Poe compendium. And here's an interesting question I never thought I'd ask. Is this lens too sharp? I know that sounds like a weird proposition, but I have a personal issue with modern photography where you end up with clinically perfect, but soulless images. Bear in mind that for much of the time, I was shooting through glass or fences, which did impact on image quality at times, such as with King Lear here, imperiously surveying his domain. I shot this Komodo dragon through a grubby window stained with dragon piss and smeared with kid snot and ice cream finger smudges. And I still managed to get some detail. But in some cases, I just found things too contrasty, too crisp, I find the default video settings on the Nikon are always over sharpened, so I go for the flattest footage I can make and then amp it up in Premiere, but even the raw images were just a bit too good for my liking. For this bird photo, I had to do my own Orton effect, adding a high pass filter with some Gaussian blur to bloom the highlights a bit to soften the harshness of the reeds. But it's not like the lens is incapable of character. I quite like this image where the cyclone fence in front of this bird created some nice bokeh bubbles to add a bit of interest to the background. Of course, if it was f2.8, it would probably be obliterated anyway. But even a more moderate aperture, this gives a smooth but not too boring rendering of the out of focus areas. And of course, when you need that sharpness, it's there, as in the unsettling alien iris of this penguin, which may go some way to explaining the comical physiology of these creatures, our future alien overlords, lulling us to a false sense of security as they slide around on glaciers on their bloated bellies. In case you hadn't guessed by now, I'm not a wildlife photographer. I was almost going to name this video that, but I figured if I mentioned the actual lens in the title, I'd be more likely to get some clicks. One thing I'll definitely be doing in the future is looking at programming the function button to switch between autofocus modes on my camera. But that's probably more of an indication of my own and the camera's inadequacies rather than the lens's ability to find focus. The main reason I purchased it was because I've got an ongoing telephoto project recording the ships that steam up and down the Perth coast and I've been shooting with my 70 to 200 with a teleconverter on it and more recently this Sigma zoom lens that zooms up to 500 millimeters but requires a screw drive focusing mechanism. Um, but I did get that one for an absolute steal. Check out this other video if you need further evidence to prove the fact that I really am not a wildlife photographer. I've been happy so far with the shots I've taken manually focusing on a tripod, but this gives me more reach and more importantly, it has allowed me to capture images such as this. One thing that I haven't really focused on, largely because I got away with shooting at fast shutter speeds of slow moving tortoises, is the VR on this thing. Between IBIS and the lens, you're getting five and a half stops of image stabilization that allows you to capture low light landscapes, or in this case, seascapes handheld. Really, I can't imagine wanting anything more out of a lens. It's probably worth mentioning now that for 3000 Australian dollars, this lens isn't cheap, but definitely a bargain compared to what else is out there that can compare. And the Nikon Z 180 to 600 is a perfect compromise in terms of sharpness, size, weight, and versatility. So while you're busy now, hitting like and subscribe because you want to see more examples of mediocre photography with amazing equipment, let's conclude and save you from many more of my sesquipedalian rambling. This isn't a perfect lens, but it's a great one. 
I can handhold it all day and would even consider traveling with it, but I do think I've already found its perfect use case. If Tankers on the Horizon ever becomes a legitimate photography genre, then I'll be its progenitor, promoter, and greatest purveyor of long distance shots of ships and sunsets, and this beast is now destined to be my loyal, if somewhat imposing, companion on that quest. Later.